everyone, uh, welcome to you. We look forward to what you have to share with us this morning, or this afternoon, actually. Thank you for that introduction, Sam. Ah, there I am. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk today. Um, so um, thanks to the conference organisers. Um, I've been well looked after, so um, a big thank you. Um, it's always interesting when you're the guy talking about nutrition just before lunch. <laughs> so um, I'm going to go through some work that um, we're doing around the role of red meat in terms of global nutrition. Right? Global nutrition is an important term. Feeding a globe is very different to feeding me or you. Right? And I'll, I'll talk about that. Okay, so... Um, Red meat and global nutrition is, um, as I said, topic. Yes. So the first thing I want to do um, is acknowledge the team, right? Because I don't get to come and give talks like this Stop without them, his screen down there. right? And, and I really Stop want to give screen. acknowledgement to Andrew Fletcher and Nick Smith. Um, without all the modelling work they've done, I wouldn't be able to give you the data that I'm going to give you today. So I'm going to start off with uh, um, the picture today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, so, um, so where um, Sustainable Nutrition Initiative works is, is in this area um, around sustainability and sustainable nutrition, right? So there's a definition of that that's recognised internationally. Um, about food systems that ensure um, food security and nutrition for all. The for all is important. Um, and done in such a way as um, economic, social and, and environmental basis for generating food security um, and nutrition of future generations is not compromised. Um, that sounds easy, and it's not. Um, so we have something called the Delta model, and this is a, um, a scenario model, right? It allows us to run scenarios of the future food production um, systems that we could have in the world, and then see the consequence for feeding the globe. Um, and so the things that you need to do that um, can be modeled. And um, this picture is the basis for something that's incredibly complex, but it's our model. Um, and so, as I said, scenario model. What scenario do you want to run? Right? Could be, um, what does the world look like if we're all vegan? Is a scenario you could run in the model. Um, we look at total food production um, from FAO food balance sheets. Um, then we, um, we take out um, waste and supply chain losses. They're considerable. Most people would know about the waste issue. Um, we look at non we take out non-food uses, so these are foods that could be consumed by humans, but they're used for non-food um, uses. And we also um, take out feed, so these are human consumable foods that are fed to animals, right? And what's left is the food available for, for human consumption. And then we um, use um, food composition data from the USDA so that we can convert that to nutrients available for consumption. Um, and in the case of protein and amino acids, we take into account their bioavailability, right? So a unit of protein, depending on where it comes from, doesn't give you the same amino acids, okay? Plant proteins, for example, tend to have lower bioavailability than animal source foods. So we take that into account when we're thinking about amino acid nutrients available from food consumption. And then we just compare that to our requirements um, using population data, um, and, and we can run these scenarios, and I'm going to show you a few of those along the way. One interesting thing about this is 75% of the food available for our consumption is from plants. 25% is from animal source foods. Remember the number. Um, so when you, um, the model runs 29 nutrients, and those are along the bottom of this graph. Um, 
And what I've done here is I've plotted that against the various food groups um, to, quite, to give you an indication of where meat fits in, right? That red is, is the nutrients available from, um, from meat, not red meat, but meat. Um, and, and you can see, um, you know, that, that there are areas in this graph where, where meat plays a role. Vitamin B12, huge. Um, and then there are areas where it doesn't, right? So um, calcium, okay? The current world food system is short of calcium. We do not produce in the world enough calcium to satisfy the global population's demand for calcium. The same for vitamin E. But meat is not a source of either of those nutrients, right? Um, but you can see the um, ones here that are important to meat. Um, and as I've been indicating, this is about globes. It's about the population, right? We can set the population. So we have a model, for example, we're developing which sets the population as being New Zealand. Um, but this one I'm talking about is really the globe. Um, and, and then we look at requirements, right? So requirement is the purple line. Okay? You have to be above the purple line to satisfy the globe's requirement for that nutrient. So you can immediately see down there calcium well below the line. Okay? Meat. These are the nutrients that meat has a really important role in providing, which are either under the line or very, very close to it. Now, except lysine, which is above the line. Um, what's happened there? You're destroying my slide. <laughs> um, and um, the reason I put lysine in here is that um, the world talks about protein, right? I was very upset with a minister last night because he talked about the, the red meat industry and the export of protein. No, nah, export of food, right? Red meat is mainly about micronutrients, not about protein. That's a really important thing to know and to remember and to do something about, right? Um, and you can see here, um, you know, vitamin B12, the world would have a real problem if we took red meat out of the equation in terms of adequate vitamin B12 supply, okay? Anybody in the room who's vegan and you're not taking a vitamin B12 supplement, I'll do something about that because it's nearly impossible to get vitamin B12 out of plant sources. Um, and um, if my slide wasn't destroyed, uh, <laughs> then um, you'd see that there are other nutrients which are really close. Vitamin A, um, one of these is iron, um, and um, some of the vitamin, other vitamin B12s. Within this, we can actually start to break up meat into its components, right? And so this graph, offal and fats, other meats, pig meat, poultry meat, and ruminant meat, right? And you can see um, the, in terms of a lot of nutrients, the importance of offal and fat as a way of providing those nutrients into the global food system. Meat is the pink one along the bottom, um, red meat, and you can see where that's important. Where does this become important? Later on, I'm, I'm going to talk about environmental things, right? And um, depending on how those are calculated, you get different answers. If you calculate them for meat, you get a different answer to if you calculate them for red meat. So um, I'm going to show you a little animation and, um, about meat, and I'll talk about it when it's finished. It takes about three minutes. Population requires increasing food and nutrient availability. Meat is recognized as a nutrient-dense food, particularly notable for its high-quality protein content, heme iron, B vitamins, and mineral content. But how important is meat currently in nourishing the global population? The Delta model was used to calculate the contribution of meat to the global availability of 29 nutrients. 
This model utilizes global food production data coupled with data for food waste, nutrient composition, and bioavailability to calculate the total amount of each nutrient available for consumption by the global population. Around 330 million tonnes of meat were produced globally in 2018, 95% of which was used for food, constituting about 7% of total food mass. Meat's contribution to nutrient availability was disproportionately higher than this, providing 11% of global food energy availability, 29% of dietary fat, and 21% of protein. For the micronutrients, meat provided high proportions of vitamins. A, B1 and B2, B5, B6, and B12. Meat also provided high proportions of several trace elements. Zinc, selenium, iron, phosphorus, and copper. However, meat was a poor contributor to several other nutrients, including fiber, magnesium, and vitamins C and E, which are largely sourced from plant foods. The importance of meat for supply of bioavailable indispensable amino acids was also investigated. Indispensable amino acids are the building blocks of protein and must be sourced from our diet. Meat was responsible for between 16 and 32% of the global availability of these nutrients, due partly to the high bioavailability of these nutrients in meat. The disproportionate contribution of meat to the global availability of many nutrients emphasizes its important place in delivering nutrition to the current global population. However, we know that meat is not consumed or available equitably. In many diets, there can be an issue of overconsumption of meat beyond nutritional need, and meat's presence in unhealthy, highly processed formats at the expense of other nutritious foods. This carries a health burden that must be remedied alongside nutrient deficiencies. The extent to which meat should feature in our diets is under debate from health, economic and environmental standpoints. It's important that the nutritional context be included in this debate. Meat's importance will vary depending on the nutritional profile of an individual's diet or that of a specific population. The Delta model demonstrates the current contribution of different food groups to global nutrition and lets us see what changes might be made to feed the world in the future. It provides the human nutrition context to any debate, decision making or policy on the future of the food system. Take a look for yourself. So um, about a year and a half ago, um, we made the decision that we would produce one of these animations for every paper we published. And the reason for that is that these animations provide all the information that's in the paper in a way that's a lot more digestible for a wider range of people than having to read a scientific paper. Um, and um, so we published this paper all last year. And um, this meeting is the first public hearing of this animation, right? And so we'll put this up on the website. It'll go live um, um, tomorrow. Um, and it's to go and get across a lot of the information that's in that paper that's mentioned at the end. Um, we hear this a lot, right? It's a question we get asked. If we reduce meat production, i.e. take meat out of our diets, won't there be more food and therefore nutrients for human consumption? Right? So um, we've modelled that. What happens if you have a food system that has no red meat in it? Right? So the, the way this works, the colours reflect the type of food group. Right? So green is plant, not surprising. Um, and red is meat. Okay? The black line, that's the intake we need of whatever. In this case, energy is the first one. Um, 2018 is the um, 
the year that we have complete data, right? So that's the most up-to-date date in terms of the data sets we use. And so the first one is energy, and you can see that if you take red meat out, the red bar is a bit smaller, doesn't really affect the amount of energy available. And we're well above the black line. Um, protein, you can see there is a little bit of a drop when you take red meat out, but you can see that protein is above the black line. Right? Now if we model current food production and the 2050 world population, protein would still be above the black line. It's a bit different when you start to look at some of the nutrients that I think meat are really important for. So vitamin B12 is the first one. So you can see when you have meat where, um, where um, the black line is, is close to the top, but we're above it. As soon as you take red meat out, the black line's way up there, we're way down there. There's a big gap as a consequence. Um, same thing happens with vitamin A. You can see um, above the back black line, take out red meat below the black line. Iron um, on the black line and just below, right? So the difference between these two scenarios is all the food that would have been fed to ruminants, right, that's human consumable, is now being fed to humans in the no red meat, okay? So, so the fact that you've taken the meat out and you've used those, new, those foods for human consumption you've still got big problems, right? It doesn't, it doesn't cancel it out. So, um, meat is critical in the global supply of several nutrients. I th think you would have got that message. Um, and particularly, mic and it's micronutrients that it's really important. This will be a reoccurring theme through some slides. Um, the other thing is that meat protein and their micronutrients are highly bioavailable. So what do we mean by that? The amount you eat versus the amount you absorb, right? So meat protein has an availability of about 100%. Okay? Rice protein has an availability of about 60%, which means to get the same amount of amino acid from rice, you have to eat twice as much of it. This also occurs with a number of the micronutrients, right? Although we're in a position where we don't have the best data that, for micronutrient bioavailability, which is problematic. So in our model, for example, we assume that calcium, whether it comes from dairy or plants, has the same bioavailability. But we know that's not true. We know that the plant version is much lower, right? So our model is is um, that impacts our model predictions um, quite significantly. So B12, same problem. We don't correct for bioavailability, and it will be lower, right? So, so that gap gets bigger when you put those things into the model. Um, so red meat, about a quarter of global meat supply, and has a similar contribution to nutrient supply. We hear a lot about eating less meat, um, and ask, you know, what does that mean for us? It's very context diet dependent. It really depends on, on, on what the population consume in terms of their diet that you're looking at. If we had our individual model, um, the same would apply. The problem, though, is meeting nutrient requirements. That's the thing you're up against. And uh, foods like meat and dairy are, are high concentration nutrient providers, right? They, they, they form a very low amount of energy consumption, but a very high amount of um, nutrients, particularly um, micronutrients. So um, plants are the opposite. They don't have a lot of micronutrients, but they have a lot of energy. And so balancing diets um, is, is um, difficult, right? You need plants, but you, you need um, animal source foods to really be able to do it well. Right, um, so this paper um, has been very well cited, right? 
global burden of disease and, and the effects of diet on it, right? Um, this was a disaster for the meat industry because it painted the meat industry as essentially a cancer-causing plague. Um, and, and there's been an enormous amount of work come from this paper trying to figure out if it's true. And um, there's been follow-up, a number of follow-up papers, right? This is one of them. 36-fold um, higher estimates of deaths attributed to red meat intake in, 2000, in 2019. Is this reliable? The conclusion from this paper is that um, they expect that these estimates will drop as, as some of this work gets included in the data set. So here's some data that follows on from that. Just to explain this, relative risk of um, outcome, colorectal cancers on the y-axis, right? And um, along the x-axis, unprocessed red meat consumption, right? All the data points are under the number two on the y-axis, right? Ratings of one or two out of five are on the threshold between weak evidence and no evidence of association for the risk outcome pair. Okay, so this is work that has followed on from that global burden of disease. This has been repeated in a number of studies. They've tried to understand why, um, and, and they think it's to do with the dietary context, right? And you all know this, you can eat so much stuff, right? So if your red meat consumption is high, you're not eating other things. And, and in fact, the risk factor might be the not eating other things more than it is eating the red meat. So we, we don't really understand this. Um, this is a meeting that occurred in Dublin, societal role of meat, what the science says. Um, we attended this. Um, out of that came the Dub Dublin Declaration. Some of you might have read it. Um, so this brought together all of the kind of science, both um, environmental, health, social, and so on, in regard to red meat. Um, and, you know, it's an excellent um, publication if anyone wants to track it down. It was an interesting meeting. I didn't attend this. Nick did. Um, and um, it was the first meeting he'd been to where on your introduction slide, you had to put whether you were uh, an oct whether you were a meat eater or a vegan or a vegetarian, you had to state your position before you gave your talk. Um, so this is some follow-up work from Ty Beale and, and his team. So Ty's going to be here in New Zealand um, later in the year. Um, he's going to give a talk at the Nutrition Society meeting here in Auckland. Um, and I know he's going to do some work with um, beef and lamb while he's here. Um, and he's be, he does a, a number of things, but he's been looking at micronutrient deficiencies. And, you know, some of these numbers are very scary, right? So if you have a look, one in two preschool-aged children suffer from at least one micronutrient deficiency. Two in three women of reproductive age suffer from at least one micronutrient deficiency. That's in the world. Um, further over there, um, looking at um, selected groups of micronutrients, so zinc, iron, and um, vitamin A. 56% of preschool aged children were deficient. The one next door is about women of reproductive age. Um, similar set of nutrients, but this one includes um, folate. 69%. Big numbers, scary numbers. Um, in in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, nine out of ten people. But it's not just those countries. Stuff below. One in two women in the UK. One in three women in the UK have some kind of micronutrient deficiency in the US, and um, one in five in both countries are iron deficient. This is scary stuff in terms of the future of nutrition. Um, most people, I think, would have heard of the Eat Lancet planetary diet. So this is the diet to save the world. 
and um, it, it's, it's had a bit of a battering, to say the least. Um, and in recent times, its, it's lack of addressing micronutrients has really um, caused it a lot of problems. And, you know, you can see there in terms of iron, calcium, vitamin B12, zinc, um, this diet doesn't cut it. Um, this has led to a whole lot of things. Um, so in the nutrition and environment world, everyone wants a number, right? They want to be able to hold up a food and say this is a one out of five or a five out of five, right? And it's led to this flourishing world of nutritional life cycle analysis, okay? I hate these things because they're not very reliable. So it's the environmental impact divided by the nutritional value. If you get a high score, it's bad because it means you've got a high environmental impact and or a low nutritional value. Problem is, how do you assess nutritional value, right? You could look at mass, so how many grams do you eat? You could look at servings, right, and they define a serving of each food. Um, you can look at calories. All food provides calories, right? Or you could look at protein. Problem with that is apples don't provide protein. Perfectly good thing to eat. Um, you know, and so how do you actually assess nutritional value? New Zealand uses health, rate, health star ratings, right? But the Ministry of Health tell you not to compare foods with foods health star ratings. So it's not very useful. This table um, is just to illustrate a point, right? Along the top, um, you've got some um, nutritional LCAs. And these um, are using a range of environmental impacts, largely around um, CO2, right? And then uh, ways of looking at the nutritional side, right? Um, in terms of amount of product, serving, so on. Now, the scary thing is, Look at the colours. They're all over the place. Green's good, red's bad, right? Some foods have those two colours in the row. <laughs> so, you know, how you describe it is, is really impacting the assessment that you make. And, and no one has come up with a way to do this consistently that makes sense. There's beef. Unfortunate, you know, but lots of yellow and orange as well as the red, right? So, you know, what do you do? So um, this was a big study done to look at environmental impacts. And what they did was they tried to judge environment based on greenhouse gases, land use, water stress, and eutrophication potential. Here's the results, right? So... Um, so environmental impact on the y-axis and then a whole range of foods along the bottom. Um, bad news is, see the one way up there? That's meat, <laughs> right? And then, and then the other ones in that, that's, that grouping's got dairy, eggs, um, meat, and um, meat alternatives in it. But they're all higher, um, but meat's really up there, right? When you go and look at this, and this is something for New Zealand to understand, is that um, the way they've calculated that is using a lot of international averages. That's not necessarily good for us, right? If you think about um, greenhouse gases for dairy, New Zealand's greenhouse gas for dairy is a quarter of the international number. Right? I don't know the answer for red meat, but, but I think red meat should know. Um, about the same. Because um, it clearly impacts the kind of numbers that are, are being touted. You don't want people overseas deciding what you are. And, and that information is then combined to give you a table like this, right? So y-axis, environmental impact score, um, x-axis, nutritional value, right? So where do you want to be? You want to be down in that corner, right? because that's the good place. So the foods that are down there are roasted potatoes, chips, onion rings, and rice. <laughs> right? 
a bit further along so that you're still in lower impact but you're less nutritional, you've got things like Coca-Cola and sugary drinks. Right? So, um, and this is, this is really due to the way these things are calculated and the problems um, with it are giving some really weird kind of um, insights, right? The foods that you think of as better for you are much more in the up, middle and higher. Mid-range for nutritional, mid-range to high for environmental impact. My brother would happy, be happy because he loves onion rings. But. <laughs> New Zealand picture. Um, so what we did was we looked at um, trade flows. Um, what we produced, what we exported, what we kept, as well as what we imported. Okay? To know what is the New Zealand position in terms of the nutrients available to New Zealanders. We're fine in terms of macronutrients, no problems. But we have big problems with calcium, potassium, folate, vitamin C, vitamin E, and we don't eat enough fibre. Okay. But calcium, interesting. We produce nine times more calcium than this country's people need. Yet, we have a calcium deficiency here. And the same for a number of other nutrients. So the foods we produce are high in a number of these things, but we largely export them. Um, the answer, by the way, is not to stop exporting milk. There's plenty of milk. New Zealanders just don't drink milk. Um, MPI asked us to look at New Zealand in the context of APIC countries, because they thought that New Zealand was really important to the APEC countries as a food supplier. No, we're a drop in the ocean. They didn't like that answer, but that's, that's the truth of it. So um, less than 5% of, of China's calcium imports and less than 1% of their consumption. Same story for iron and protein in the USA. So, so we're producers of high quality foods, but we're relatively small producers by a world standard. We are much more important to Pacific Island, right, those around us, and um, to countries who have poor food security, who are in the APEC group. Something else I heard from the minister last night, that we feed 40 million people. We don't. We don't, not at all. 40 million people, actually probably more than that, get nutrients from New Zealand products, but we don't feed them, right? Sustainably and adequately, we do not feed them. They just get, they eat our foods and they get some, some of the nutrients they need, right? But this number gets chucked around a lot in terms of our industries. Actually, worse, we can't, act, we can't even effectively feed our own 5 million without imports. The, um, the, the thing I think that's important here is, in terms of how we think about ourselves, we need to really understand the environmental impacts of our foods in the world stage and be pushing that information rather than letting other people decide what it is for us. Take home messages. So um, meat has a vital role in the nutrient supply. Meat um, is about a quarter to a third of this contribution, so about of, of actual total meat. Um, the meat picture varies radically between global, regional, and individual perspectives, but is much more than a protein story. The more, te de the more detailed view of nutrition is gaining traction internationally, right? So what do I mean by that? Well, um, protein is not a nutrient. It's a source of the nutrients, which are the amino acids, and it's the essential amino acids. And there's a big story there about bioavailability. So depending on the protein you eat, how much amino acid do you get from that? You know, that's a much more complex picture of the one that's been told in the past around protein. You know, and and 
going into the, that level of detail, people don't like it because it suddenly doesn't become, it's not simple anymore. But, but that's the way we have to go. And as I said, we've got to push our environmental credentials. Um, the food system must be plant-based and animal optimised, right? You saw that strap line that we use on the video. Um, what do we mean by that? So total food production, 75% going to human consumption is plant-based. 25% comes from animal source foods. They, their role is high concentration of nutrients, particularly micronutrients, and a low concentration of energy. And that's their role in developing sustainable diets that adequately feed people. We need a, a fully sustainable food system, right? That is right up there with climate change in terms of its current importance and its importance over the next fairly long while. They're related, climate change, food production. Um, a healthy diet for one individual is not necessarily sustainable globally. What does that mean? I could choose to be a vegan, right? I get paid enough, I can afford the fact that vegan diets are higher, about three times. Um, I know enough about nutrition that I understand that I'd need to take a vitamin B12 supplement and a couple of others. So I can, I can live as a vegan quite happily. You model this, the world cannot be vegan. We can't, make, we can't produce enough nutrients. We don't have enough land to grow enough plant material to do that. We could do it vegetarian, but it would require major changes. Everyone would suddenly have to drink a lot more milk to get the nutrients that you would need. This is quite common. Environmentally sustainable diets, food systems are healthy. I hear that a lot. Well, they're not. There's no guarantee of that at all. Right? You saw that graph I showed you? We were all going to eat onion rings. OK. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Warren. Uh, certainly plenty of food uh, for thought there. <laughs> uh, we've, got, we've got about 10 minutes for questions, so um, let's get into it. Hamish, over here. Yeah, I, I can just yell. Yeah. It's, just, it's just around um, supplementation. Sure. Well, I don't use meat as a supplement for vitamin B12, but... No, but what, my, my question is, the supplements have got to come from somewhere. Sure. Um, where do the supplements come from? Yeah. Um, it, 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 this is a vexing question, right? Because um, if you wanted to really help people, you're talking about um, eight or nine supplements. Um, and you'd have to manufacture them in a reasonably high level. So mostly that's done through bacterial fermentation, right? Um, you know, so it's not a case of just a bit of extra vitamin B12. There's a bunch of things um, that come as a consequence. Um, and the other problem is what are they made from? So calcium is a classic, right? Calcium supplements are largely made from material that's poorly available to you. So a consequence of taking a calcium supplement, excuse my language, is that your feces get higher in calcium, and you don't. <laughs> and that's the other problem with a lot of these kind of supplements is their availability. Now, vitamin B12 um, capsules are, are available, so they're fine. But, um, but, but I think there's a message in there around your question about what is meat there for, right? And it's not there just to provide protein. It's important for protein, but that's not its sole reason for being. And there are some very, there are other things that meat is absolutely important for. Because you can't get B12 um, from anything other than animal source foods. Um, and, you know, that's why for me, that's a really important one for red meat. 
Take that message with you, trade envoy. <laughs> James Parsons. Warren, thanks there. Uh, just the 40 million people in terms yep. of meals, can you just provide a little more clarity on that? Because sure. a lot of us have been guilty of peddling that line. It's a nice, yeah, yeah. nice easy yeah, yeah. one. Is um, it 40 million meat meals or it's no, not 40 so million it's, people? It's, it's foods exported out of New Zealand. Um, and so, um, and, and it's probably not, it's probably more like 100 million. Um, and could be as high as a billion. Um, so what that means is, is the people who in some form or another get nutrients from eating New Zealand foods, right? But, but 40 million people don't get adequate nutrients to fully feed them from New Zealand foods. So could you just say just meat though? No, I no, think my understanding, and there might be somebody in the room, but my understanding was maybe that 40 million came from our, our exports create so many calories and that would yep. feed 40 million people, and that's, that's right. how that number that's was, how it came was out. calculated. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, what is the line then, I suppose? What can we peel yes. down? Um, I, it's a good question, actually. Um, and um, I, I think we need to start thinking about what do our foods we export have in them, right? So um, we've recently been engaged with Fonterra, convincing them not to go around trying to sell milk, but rather to convince them about um, sustainable diets and the role of milk in it. And it's not a protein story, and it's not even a protein and calcium story because milk provides um, quite a number of nutrients. And so I think the focus needs to be more on the good it's doing, right? And um, meat certainly has a number of nutrients that, that it plays um, positive roles for. Um, so I think that's more important than just saying 40 million. Yep. Um, hi. My, my question is with the micronutrient calculation, yep. uh, did you take into account or do you need to take into account uh, what the animal ate? And if yes, yep. did you do that, I guess? Yeah, yeah. So... Um, you do, um, but we don't. Um, so we use the USDA um, databases, right? So that's an averaging. Um, you know, I mean, does, you know, do New Zealand products stick to the USDA average? And um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but I think that would be useful to know because it might give you an, a better marketing position. Yep. We've got one down the back, right? Yeah. yeah. Just your comments on the role of cultured products going forward? Cultured meats, cultured milk? <laughs> oh, that's really unfair. Um, I, um, to be blunt, I'm sceptical. And I'm not sceptical about the technology. The technology works at a lab scale. I'm sceptical about your ability to commercialise it on a scale that will make a difference. Right. So we've heard recently about the two in Singapore and America that have been commercialised. Right. And the restaurants that sell them, one day every two weeks, you can go and have it. Because that's the amount they can produce. Right? And I was reading um, a calculation from Paul Wood in Australia, who was looking at their um, production. And their maximum production will be used by McDonald's in one second. So, you know... As a technology, it's a long way from being commercialised at a, at a size where you can really impact the world. We've got a model coming out soon, plug here, um, later this year, um, which looks at um, milk protein fermentation. And um, the base scenario is to produce 10% of the world's milk protein as one protein. So to do that, you would have to grow 40 to 50% more um, sugar cane than the world currently grows. That's a massive increase. We don't have the land to be able to do that, which means you'd have to not grow something. Um, you would need all the energy from two medium-sized European countries. And if you want to meet environmental standards, it would have to be renewable energy. And the world doesn't currently produce anywhere enough renewable energy to do it. Um, the factory size would be um, 
And it's not one factory, it's a bunch of factories because you also need to make all the amino acids, etc. You're talking about a land area greater than Melbourne to do that amount of milk protein. So, um, so I think we're a long way from being able to commercialise this in any way that works. We've got time for one more question. Oh, Warren, yeah. this, is, uh, this is great information. The challenge is, like, when we saw that Gen Z conversation, sure. what do we win and lose the conversation on? Because this is the new trend sure. aspect, yep. you know, interlinked with the how do we produce the most efficient micronutrient? Yeah, all right. Because this is, this is one part of the picture versus all yeah, the parts. Yeah. yeah, I agree, right? And the reason that four years ago we set up ECNI was because we wanted to come into the discussion with fact-based conversations because they were clearly lacking and still are today. Um, you know, and don't want to point the finger at anybody, but, you know, the kind of advertising that the people who are into the, um, that meat story, what are they doing? Well, they're trying to get um, investors, right? And so the kind of things they say leave a little bit to be desired. So I think where we're losing is, um, is being able to have sensible, fact-based conversations. There is too much rhetoric out there, which is old wives' tales. Oh, better let the boss Yeah, the should, we, should we just cut it off there if Sue Lachlan's <laughs> got a question? Warren? Hey, Warren, thank you so much for a fascinating presentation. We're under a lot of pressure here in New Zealand, uh, the agricultural sector, sure. to reduce our emissions. Yep. And we do have to. There's no question about that. We have yep. to improve our carbon efficiency. Yep. Problem is, the accounting system that we are being faced with is based on northern hemisphere uh, <laughs> emissions intensities yeah, for yeah. product. Who's doing the work to turn this debate internationally to get greater understanding sure. of that? Actually, if we, if we reduce production in highly carbon efficient countries, we do more harm in delivering the nutrients that are needed globally. Sure. Um, you know, I don't disagree. And, and I've heard people say, well, why don't we produce milk in New Zealand? Because we do it so much better than other people from a, a greenhouse gas point of view. Um, unfortunately, that's not very useful because we don't produce very much of it. And, and we can't, we could never produce enough of it to really um, take a position like that. Um, so, you know, I think we, industry, um, as well as government, we heard this morning, I really, I enjoyed that guy's talk, um, have to be connected and out there um, talking about the New Zealand position. And, and, and I think we need to, um, I, I was talking to Zespri on Friday, um, about um, NLCAs, and uh, NLCA for kiwi fruit is is not New Zealand's; it's an international one. And um, and I said to them, "Well, you don't want that. You want New you want a New Zealand one. You should you should do a project um, to calculate that, and then push that number because I can tell you now it'll be lower." Um, so I I yeah I think. Our, our exporting industries need to um, get on top of that sort of stuff um, and then in conjunction with government be pushing those numbers overseas because, um, you know, as you saw on that graph, the, it, it would be much lower, much lower. Um, and, and then you end up in different conversations, don't you, um, around, you know, what's expected of New Zealand in regard to its environmental performance. Because they're not looking at you as being way up here, they're looking at you as being down here. I can squeeze one more question if anybody's got a burning one. one. Right, we'll, um, we'll halt it um, there. Just um, want to acknowledge um, Sue Lockwood in the room. Sue Lockwood's just taken the role as chair of Reddit, and I see a couple of um, papers or projects coming, <laughs> or a couple of new projects coming there. But, um, Certainly, Warren, I want to acknowledge what you and the centre does. I think it is absolutely um, critical work that you're doing, and it's world class, and it's massively important that we as a sector actually utilise it in terms of how we uh, deliver our products and our messages um, internationally. 
So listen, we've had a lot of um, nutritional information to absorb this morning, and I know that we're, um, we're eating into your lunch hour, but um, I just want to, Warren, give you uh, a gift of thanks, and this is from oh, Wilson you. Hallaby. So thank you very much oh, uh, for you. that, and I'd uh, ask you to show your appreciation for Warren, please. Thank you.